2 Samuel 6, 14 through 21, Job 1, 20 through 22, and 2, 9 and 10. And when you get it, you can stand. Do Job again. Uh, Job 1, 20 through 22, and 2, 9 and 10. 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 21. 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 21. 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 21, Job 1, 20 through 22, and Job 2, 9 and 10. You want to have a devotion or something? Like that? Uh, 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 21 reads, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. Amen. And David was girded with a linen epoch. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle, and David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering, burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel as well, to the women as, uh, to the women as men, to everyone, a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his house. And Micah, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovering himself. And David said unto Micah, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father, and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore I will play before the Lord. Job 1.20 22. Then Job rose and ran his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, yeah. and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In Job 2 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, Wilt thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Mm -hmm. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the profile of people who have problems with praise. <laughs> profile of people who have problems with praise. Can you say that with me? The profile of people who have problems with praise. If God is clear that he desires to be praised, why then does praise create such controversy? If he has clearly instructed us to praise him, why are there so many distractors? Uh, the human logic of the unregenerate will always find praise baffling and ignorant. Their faces will frown in frustration when somebody sitting near them expresses praise to God. The Christian yet carnal mind finds praise uncomfortable, threatening sometimes and even intimidating. And most of all, Satan despises praise. Yeah. So you need to be careful when you find yourself in the same arena as the devil. Well, well, well. I'm convinced that as God restores praise to the church, it will be fiercely contested by the enemies of believers. Uh, you know who our enemies are. We have the internal enemy of the flesh. Uh, you do know your own flesh will protest the practice of praise. 
If you haven't felt that in the midst of all this praising, then I wonder if you really say Well, because the flesh wars against the spirit. Amen. But then we have the eternal, external enemy called the world. And so often we get so close to the standards and the expectations of the world that we succumb to the critiques and criticisms of the world. And if some of our friends out there come in here, we get a little self-conscious about praise and stiff it up because we don't act the same way out there. And they look at you like, is that, is that brother so-and-so? He was saying some stuff at the job the other day, is that really? And then we have that third enemy, that infernal enemy, Satan. Sometimes we shrink under the sinister attacks of Satan. Yeah. He'll try to shame us or try to hit us so hard with the attacks of adversity that we don't feel like praising God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, for the most part, people who have problems or who are uncomfortable with praise, uh, they may be well intended. Sometimes they're greatly concerned about the Lord's church. They're even committed to developing their relationship with the Lord in some cases. But because of certain things instilled in them, uh, and because of ingrained traditions, may not find it possible uh, to be free in spirit. All right. uh, it's possible to be so ingrained and have certain attitudes, psychologically, socially, and spiritually, that you can feel prohibited when it comes to a demonstrative display of your feelings. All of us are made different by our personalities, yes, our social and cultural experiences. Yes. And there are some people who are further along and freer than others. Mm -hmm. So I've come today with both a caution and a challenge. The caution, on our own, is as we talk and preach and teach on this subject of praise, well, don't expect everybody to be at the same level at the same time. Well, well, we'll defeat yeah. the purpose of praise if we start looking at one another out of the corner of our eyes. Uh, about when he or she doesn't praise God the way they ought to. Well, uh, you, you don't have the right to write a prescription for how I praise you. And if you did, it would never be picked up. You see, because of personality tendencies and inclination, some of us have been looking forward to the opportunity to praise because you're in to praise. Yeah. But then there are others. It's going to take you much longer to rationally digest the principles and practice of praise. Yeah. But the challenge is if you're a sincere believer, you ought to plot a course of deliberate scriptural education on the issue of praise. Uh, if you know that you're not where you ought to be in this area, then don't curse the darkness, light a candle. Don't miss that. Don't, don't sit down and wallow in your ignorance and complain. Get up and study the Word of God. And see what God Himself has to say about this matter of praise. And so this morning, I'm going to take just a couple of people from the word to see what happened to them. They were, well, they protested, protested praise, and then what actually happened? Uh, perhaps these beautiful characters that we're going to talk about this morning have some unwitting kinfolk in our midst today. So the first one we're going to look at is this wife of David by the name of Michael. Uh, for the background of our story, Michael was the daughter of King Saul and the wife of David. And this story, along with 1 Chronicles 13 through 15, uh, deal with when Jonathan and Saul uh, were already dead. And so David was crowned king. And one of David's first official acts as king was to return the Ark of the Covenant to its rightful place in the Holy City. Uh, the Ark was significant because it was emblematic of the presence of God among his people. And the Ark reminded the people of God of their covenant relationship with him. So the first time they tried to bring the ark to the holy city, they were unsuccessful. Because they didn't do it according to the guidelines that God had prescribed. Yeah. All right. He told them to put the arks on the shoulders of holy anointed men. Yeah. But they constructed a cart and, and tried to let the ark ride on the cart. And when the ark almost fell, the result was death 
for one of the men who tried to balance it. You Bible readers know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they would be to the ark for a while over the old man Edom. And when they got it right, uh, because you see, it was the right mission, but the wrong man. Uh, well, the lesson we learned from this is you, you can't do God's will your way. You got to do God's will God's way. They had the right mission, but the wrong method. Uh, when they finally got the manner right, God blessed them. And there they were, with a great day set aside. And then David saw the ark coming into the city with all the celebration. He looked up and saw the regal entourage that was following the ark. When he saw the high worship service and heard the sounds of the trumpets and the cymbals, the flutes, uh, along with the people shouting and praising God, it was too much for him just to stand there and not do anything. Right, right. And as he watched the ark making his way into the holy city, yeah. the symbolic presence of God yeah. returning to his rightful place, David said, I can't stand. Yeah. <laughs> so the Bible said he broke out into a holy day. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just drop this real quick. Before we move on, this is not a license for you to go to the club and drop it like a hot. This ain't a license. So I've heard too many times, David dance. That's like giving you a right. I mean, is a wrist still open? A wrist or whatever? A smile is? No, it don't give you that right. To back up nothing. David did a holy thing. Some of this stuff ain't going on ain't holy. We're going to get off the rabbit trail and go on back. <laughs> the Hebrew word that's translated says he danced, he, he jumped and stomped and leaped and skipped. Wow. And no doubt he was singing as he was doing it, but the text said Michael was looking through the window. She saw the king take his robe up and go leaping around, acting like he was uncouth. She put her hands on her hips and couldn't wait till he got to the house. Look at verse 20 in 2 Samuel 6. Uh, she came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today! He uncovered himself in the eyes of the handmaid of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. In other words, she's saying, Man, you should have seen yourself. Boy, if you distinguish yourself today, brother. <laughs> and then you have the nerve to call yourself a king. <laughs> and she was saying in so many words, you weren't acting today like king or act. Right. Uh, she couldn't cope with the change of his behavior. Yeah. She had a prescribed way that her husband should act. And she had some preconceived ideas about what kingly conduct was, right. especially since her father, Saul, yes, had been king. That's right. Right. Uh, when David not, did not fit her uh, conceptual mold, she got mad and tried to scold him. And well, some, some sister might say right here, well, maybe she had a point, Pastor. It says he came out of his clothes. If it's my husband, I'd be upset too. But look at verse 14. It says, David danced before the Lord all his might, and he was girded with the linen he found. Yeah. So then he was girded around the waist. Yeah. He wasn't out there with no clothes on at all. He didn't take everything off. He just took off the vestiges of his boy. He didn't come out everything. Uh, so get your mind back. Get back in here. I'm trying to imagine this stuff. Just get, get right back in here. <laughs> now we're not sure exactly what all happened in her mind, but we can glean several things from this that perhaps she may have been thinking. First of all, she may have felt her dignity had been violated. She felt like David could have acted more kingly. Uh, she thought perhaps he should have been somewhere being pompous and giving orders and flaunting his power. You do know who was the king. Uh, and if he's going to join the excitement of the parade, he should have done that. Uh, he, should have, he should have rather stood there erect and under control. But David blew her mind when he disrobed himself of her expectations. Now there's another reason implied in the text. She says, and covered himself in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants. She not only felt her dignity had been violated, but she also felt that if the king started acting a fool, that it would be a reflection on her. But the second reason she said to him was that, David, you didn't even care who was watching. 
Maybe if you had done that with your peer behind closed doors, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been so bad, baby. But you just hauled out on the street. You <laughs> lost your respect because the people are not on your level. Uh, and, and there you are embarrassing yourself. But now, this is the genuine expression of praise, what he was doing. Yes, praise is not affected by what surrounds it. That's right. Praise does not care who's present. Praise is not looking for any man-made accolades or compliments. Praise is more concerned about praising and exalting God than it is by gathering compliments and respect from me. Look at what David said to her in verse 21. It was before the Lord that showed me. He said, you didn't choose me as king. The Lord made me king before your man and before all his house to appoint me over the ruler of his people. All right. Uh, therefore, I will play yeah. before the Lord. In other words, I'll celebrate. Yeah. He said, no man chose me. God chose me. Yeah. And he chose me over your death. Yeah. 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 And he chose me over anybody else in your daddy's family. Yeah. Uh, me, me and your brother were close, Jonathan. But he chose me over Jonathan. Me and your nephew, Mephibosheth, were close. But he chose me over my people yeah. yeah. You see, the throne is supposed to be passed down to the family. Yeah. But God didn't give it to any of your brothers or your cousins or yeah. uncles. He passed by all of them yeah. and gave it to me. Yeah. Yeah. And what God has done for me is for me. Yeah. And because of what he's done for me, I don't care what you say, Michael. I'm going to praise you. Yeah. You know, well, go sit down somewhere. Yeah. I didn't scheme to get it. I wouldn't even kill your daddy, even though I could have on two occasions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I respected your daddy's position. Uh, this is what the Lord has done. And you mean to tell me when God has done something like that for me, you, know, you think I'm going to be inhibited? Well, Do you think I'm going to be a spectator and not a participant? Yeah. Baby, you got to be all wrong. <laughs> Look at what David says. I'll be more vile than thus. In other words, if you think I'm undignified today, wait till tomorrow. <laughs> He's saying, in essence, I'm going to humiliate myself in my own eyes for the glory of God. Yeah. And of the many servants which thou spoken of, them shall I be held in honor. He's saying to Michael, now, you're saying I ought to be ashamed because I dance in front of those maid servants. Uh, but really, it's, it's not them that's worried about what I did. It's you. Because I'll be honored in their presence, but, but you are the one that's offended. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the lessons we learn here, you have to watch people because they put your they, they put their feelings in other folks' mouths. Yeah. 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 When they come to you, they talk about they say. <laughs> and when they come to you talking about they say, you're looking at the they. Yeah. <laughs> they're trying to put something else in, in someone else's mouth. There, there's a kind of an attempt at transference. Uh, I'm thinking it. I'm going to download it to the they say cry. I'm going to click sin to the they say cry. And did you not know the biggest problem, especially in the church, is with the they say cry? Uh, because nobody ever takes responsibility for what they say. Uh, because what they say can be reckless. Yeah. What they say can be ruinous. Yeah. What they say can wrench one's heart. Yeah. What they say can be wretched. Yeah. And most of the time, what they say is usually wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Don't let other people define your praise. And then there's something else to note in the text. He was not at the temple or the church. He was in the public eye. He was where everybody could see him. Yet this king was not ashamed to praise God. Amen. Well, there's another Turn to Job, chapter 1, and so often we talk about Job and his trial, but today we want to focus on Mrs. Job. Because it was Sister Job who had the problem. The Lord had bragged on Job. When the devil came before the Lord, the Lord said, Devil, where you been? He said, I've been going to and fro, seeking who I can devour. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? He said, yeah, but you got a head to wrap. Now this is a paraphrased version. 
Uh, but if you take the head down, he'll curse it to your face. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the only reason he's praising you is because you won't let him touch you. Uh -huh. So he said, all right, you touch him, anything other than his soul. Yeah. And you remember how the story went. Job lost everything. Yeah. Lost his children. Yeah. Lost his wealth. Yeah. Lost his health. And the adversity through Satan's hand reduced Job from the wealthiest man in the land to a pauper. <laughs> and after he lost everything, look at verse 21. Job was said, said, Naked came I uh, from my mother's womb, and yeah. naked shall I return. Mm -hmm. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. In other words, let the name of the Lord be praised. Yeah. He says, God gave me everything I had. Yeah. My respect, my riches, my health, and my wealth. God took it. In the name of the Lord, and let him be praised in it. Uh, then the next verse said, And all this Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. In the midst of that kind of adversity and calamity, there Job was praising God. Yes, yes. Lord, I praise you in spite of what has happened to me. Yes, but now Sister Job had had just about all she could take. So she walked up and scolded her husband. Man, what's wrong with you? Yeah. If you know how foolish you look to both the world and to me. I'm your wife. You ought to be thinking about me. Uh, your God has been uh, unkind to you. Your God has taken everything that you possibly could have. Yeah. And now I won't be able to get with the ladies and be respected at the town square anymore. I'm not able to do my volunteer service with respect anymore. I can't even write another check because all that I have is gone. Well. And, and here you are out here embarrassing me by praising this God who cares nothing about you. Why don't you quit praising him and curse God and die? Be a man, Job, and die like a man. At least I'll be able to find the life insurance policy and get something out of this. Go ahead and curse God and die. Now that's the 2018 version. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 10, Job says, you talk like somebody that don't know God. Shall we receive good in the hand of God and not evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. 